I'm aware of how ironic it is that I'm a white male reading this. Um, I don't know if I've ever read a book before. But if I was to read a book right now, it would sound like this. Chapter whatever pages. Um, actually, so um, this reading of stuff that I don't know if I can read, so we're going to have to check that out here really is the goal. Uh, yeah, we're reading. I'm in the car right now. Black Feminist Epistemology, 1990, Patricia Hill Collins. As critical social theory, U.S. Black feminist thought reflects the interests and standpoints of its creators. Tracing the origin and diffusion of Black feminist thought or any comparable body of specialized knowledge reveals its affinity to the power of the group that created it. Mannheim, 1936. Because elite white men control Western structures of knowledge validation, their interests pervade the themes, paradigms, and epistemologies of traditional scholarship. As a result, U.S. black women's experiences, as well as those of women of African descent, transnationally have been routinely distorted within or excluded from what counts as knowledge. U.S. Black feminist thought as specialized thought reflects the distinctive themes of African-American women's experiences. Black feminist thought's core themes of work, family, sexual politics, motherhood, and political activism rely on paradigms that emphasize the importance of intersecting oppressions in shaping the U.S. matrix of domination. But expressing these themes and paradigms has not been easy because Black women have had to struggle against white male interpretations of the world. In this context, black feminist thought can be best viewed as subjugated knowledge. Traditionally, the suppression of black women's ideas within white male controlled social institutions led African American women to use music, literature, daily conversations, and everyday behavior as important locations for constructing a black feminist consciousness. More recently, higher education and the news media have emerged as increasingly important sites for black feminist intellectual activity. Within these new social locations, black feminist thought has often become highly visible, yet curiously, despite this visibility, it has become differently subjugated. Investigating the subjugated knowledge of subordinate groups, in this case, a black woman's standpoint and black feminist thought, requires more ingenuity than that needed to examine the standpoints and thoughts of dominant groups. I found my training as a social scientist inadequate to the task of studying the subjugated knowledge of a black woman's standpoint. This is because subordinate groups have long had to use alternative ways to create independent self-definitions and self-valuations and to re-articulate them through our own specialists. Um, yes, th so th this is written speaking from Patricia Hill Collins is a uh, voice. So just in case you're thinking I'm speaking about me, I'm not, I am, I am reading here. I think I'm reading. Can you like, let me know in the comments if I'm reading this is because subordinate groups has long had to use alternative ways to create independent self definitions and self valuations and rearticulate them through our own specialists. Like other subordinate groups, African American women not only have developed a distinctive black woman's standpoint, but have done so by using alternative ways of producing and validating knowledge. Epistemology constitutes an overarching theory of knowledge. Harding, 1987. It investigates the standards used to assess knowledge or why we believe what we believe to be true. Far from being the apolitical study of truth, epistemology points to the ways in which power relations shape who is believed and why. For example, various descendants of Sammy Hemings, a black woman owned by Thomas Jefferson, claimed repeatedly that Jefferson fathered her children. These accounts forwarded by Jefferson's African-American descendants were ignored in favor of accounts advanced by his white progeny. 
Hemming's descendants were routinely disbelieved until their knowledge claims were validated by DNA testing. Distinguishing among epistemologies, paradigms, and methodologies can prove to be useful in understanding the significance of competing epistemologies. Harding, 1987. In contrast to epistemologies, paradigms encompass interpretive frameworks such as intersectionalities that are used to explain social phenomena. Methodology refers to the broad principles of how to conduct research and how interpretive paradigms are to be applied. The level of epistemology is important because it determines which questions merit investigation, which interpretive frameworks will be used to analyze findings, and to what use any ensuing knowledge will be put. In producing the specialized knowledge of U.S. Black feminist thought, Black women intellectuals often encounter two distinct epistemologies, one representing elite white male interests and others representing Black feminist concerns. Whereas many variations of these epistemologies exist, it is possible to distill some of their distinguishing features that transcend differences among paradigms within them. Epistemological choices about whom to trust, what to believe, and why something is true are not benign academic issues. Instead, these concerns tap the fundamental question of which versions of truth will prevail. Uh, Eurocentric knowledge validation processes and U.S. power relations. You know, I just ate chips, and I'm not sure if I'm reading still. So, I gotta check to make sure if I'm reading. These words are, like, bolded. I believe it was, like, a subtitle. <clears throat> Eurocentric knowledge validation processes and U.S. power relations. In the United States, the social institutions that legitimate knowledge, as well as the Western or Eurocentric epistemologies, that they uphold constitute two interrelated parts of the dominant knowledge validation processes. In general, scholars, publishers, and other experts represent specific interests and credentialing processes, and their knowledge claims must satisfy the political and epistemological criteria of the contexts in which they reside. That's Kuhn, 1962, Mulcahy, 1979. Because this enterprise is controlled by elite white men, Knowledge validation processes reflect this group's interests. Although designed to represent and protect the interests of powerful white men, neither schools, government, the media, or other social institutions that house these processes, nor the actual epistemologies that they promote, need be managed by white men themselves. White women, African American men and women, and other people of color may be enlisted to enforce these connections between power relations and what counts as truth. Moreover, not all white men accept these power relations that privilege Eurocentrism. Some have revolted and subverted the social institutions and the ideas they promote. First, knowledge claims are evaluated by a group of experts whose members bring with them a host of sedimented experiences that reflect their group location in intersecting oppressions. No scholar can avoid cultural ideas and his or her placement in intersecting oppressions of race, gender, class, sexuality, and nation. In the United States, this means that a scholar making a knowledge claim typically must con convince a scholarly community controlled by elite white, avowedly heterosexual men holding U.S. citizenship that a given claim is justified. Second, each community of experts must maintain its credibility as defined by the larger population in which it is situated from which it draws basic taken-for-granted knowledge. This means that scholarly communities that challenge basic beliefs held in U.S. culture at large will be deemed less credible than those that support popular ideas. For example, if scholarly communities stray too far from the widely held beliefs about black womanhood, they run the risk of being discredited. While elite white men or any other overly homogenous group dominates knowledge validation processes, both of these political criteria can work to suppress black feminist thought. Given that the general U.S. culture shaping the taken-for-granted knowledge of the community of experts is permeated by widespread notion of black female inferiority, new knowledge claims that seem to violate this fundamental assumption are likely to be viewed as anomalies. Kuhn, 1962. Moreover, specialized thought challenging notions of black female inferiority is unlikely to be generated from within white male-controlled academic settings. Both the kinds of questions asked 
and the answers to them would necessarily reflect a basic lack of familiarity with black women's realities. Even those who think they are familiar can reproduce stereotypes. Believing that they are already knowledgeable, many scholars staunchly defend controlling images of U.S. black women as mammies, matriarchs, and Jezebels, and allow those common sense beliefs to permeate their scholarship. The experiences of African American women scholars. The experiences of African American women scholars illustrate how individuals who wish to rearticulate a black woman's standpoint through black feminist thought can be suppressed by prevailing knowledge validation processes. Exclusion from basic literacy, quality educational experiences, and faculty and administrative positions has limited U.S. Black women's access to influential academic positions. Black women have long produced knowledge claims that contested those advanced by elite white men. But because black women have been denied positions of authority, they often relied on alternative knowledge validation processes to generate competing knowledge claims. As a consequence, academic disciplines typically rejected such claims. Moreover, any credentials controlled by white male academicians could then be denied to black women who used alternative standards on the grounds that black women's work did not constitute credible research. Black women with academic credentials who seek to exert the authority that our status grants us to propose new knowledge claims about African American women face pressures to use our authority to help legitimate a system that devalues and excludes the majority of black women. When an outsider group, in this case African American women, recognizes that the insider group, namely elite white men, requires special privileges from the larger society, those in power must find ways of keeping the outsiders out and at the same time having them acknowledge the legitimacy of this procedure. Accepting a few safe outsiders addresses this legitimation problem. Berger and Luckman, 1966. One way of excluding the majority of black women from the knowledge validation process is to permit a few black women to acquire positions of authority in institutions that legitimate knowledge and to encourage us to work within the taken for granted assumptions of black female inferiority shaped by the scholarly community and culture at large. Those black women who accept these assumptions are likely to be rewarded by their institutions. Those challenging the assumptions can be placed under surveillance and run the risk of being ostracized. African American women academicians who persist in trying to rearticulate a black woman's standpoint also face potential rejection of our knowledge claims on epistemological grounds. Just as the material realities of powerful and dominant groups produce separate standpoints, these groups may also deploy distinctive epistemologies or theories of knowledge. Black women scholars may know that something is true, at least by standards widely accepted among African American women, but be unwilling or unable to legitimate our claims using prevailing scholarly norms. For any discourse, new knowledge claims must be consistent with the, an existing body of knowledge that the group controlling the interpretive context accepts as true. Criteria for methodological adequacy associated with positivism illustrate the standards that black women scholars, especially those in social sciences, would have to satisfy in legitimating black feminist thought. Though I describe Western or Eurocentric epistemologies as a single cluster, many interpretive frameworks or paradigms are subsumed under this category. Moreover, my focus on positivism should be interpreted neither to mean that all dimensions of positivism are inherently problematic for black women, nor that non-positivist frameworks are better. Positive approach, positivist approaches aim to create scientific descriptions of reality by producing objective generalizations. Because researchers have widely differing values, experiences, and emotions, genuine science is thought to be unattainable unless all human characteristics except rationality are eliminated from the research process. By following strict methodological rules, scientists aim to distance themselves from the values, vested interests, and emotions generated by their class, race, sex, or unique situation. By decontextualizing themselves, they allegedly become detached observers and manipulators of nature. Jagger, 1983, Harding, 1986. Several requirements typify positivist methodological approaches. First, research methods generally require a distancing of the researcher from his or her object of study by defining the researcher as a subject. 
with full human subjectivity and by objectifying the object of study. Keller, 1985. Asante, 1987. A second requirement is the absence of emotions from the research process. Jagger, 1983. Third, ethics and values are deemed inappropriate in the research process, either as a reason for scientific inquiry or as part of the research process itself. Richards, 1980. Finally, adversarial debates, whether written or oral, become the preferred method of ascertaining truth. The arguments that can withstand the greatest assault and survive intact becomes the strongest truths. Moulton, 1983. Such criteria ask African American women to objectify ourselves, devalue our emotional life, displace our motivations of furthering knowledge about black women, and confront in an adversarial relationship those with more social, economic, and professional power. On the one hand, it seems unlikely that black women would rely exclusively on positivist paradigms in rearticulating a black woman's standpoint. For example, black women's experiences in sociology illustrate diverse responses to encountering an entrenched positivism. Given black women's long-standing exclusion from sociology prior to 1970, the sociological knowledge about race and gender produced during their absence, and the symbolic importance of black women's absence to sociological self-definitions as a science, African-American women acting as agents of knowledge faced a complex situation. In order to refute the history of black women's insuitability for science, they had to invoke the tools of sociology by using positivistic frameworks to demonstrate their capability as scientists. However, they simultaneously needed to challenge the same structure that granted them their legitimacy. Their responses to this dilemma reflect the strategic use of the tools of positivism when needed, coupled with overt challenges to positivism when that seemed feasible. On the other hand, many black women have had access to another epistemology that encompasses standards for assessing truth that are widely accepted amongst African-American women. An experimental material base underlies a black feminist epistemology, namely collective experiences and accompanying worldviews that U.S. black women sustained based on our particular history. The historical conditions of black women's work, both in black civil society and in paid employment, fostered a series of experiences that, when shared and passed on, become the collective wisdom of a black woman's standpoint. Moreover, a set of principles for assessing knowledge claims may be available to those having shared these shared experiences. These principles pass into a more general black woman's wisdom, and further, into what I call here a black feminist epistemology. This alternative epistemology uses different standards that are consistent with black women's criteria for substantiated knowledge, and with her criteria for methodological adequacy. Certainly, this alternative black feminist epistemology has been devalued by dominant knowledge validation processes and may not be claimed by many African American women. But if such an epistemology exists, what are its contours? Moreover, what are its actual potential contributions to black feminist thought? Black women as agents of knowledge. Social movements of the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s stimulated a greatly changed intellectual and political climate in the United States. United States. Compared to the past, many more U.S. black women became legitimated agents of knowledge. No longer passive objects of knowledge manipulated within prevailing knowledge validation processes, African American women aimed to speak for ourselves. African American women in the academy and other positions of authority who aim to advance black feminist thought now encounter the often conflicting epistemological standards of three key groups. First, black feminist thought must be validated by ordinary African American women who, in the words of Hannah Nelson, grow to womanhood in a world where the saner you are, the matter you are made to appear. Gwaltney, 1980, page 7, I think. To be credible in the eyes of this group, Black feminist intellectuals must be personal advocates to their material, be accountable for the consequences of their work, have lived or experienced their material in some fashion, and be willing to engage in dialogues about their findings with ordinary everyday people. Historically, living life as an African-American woman facilitated this endeavor because knowledge validation processes controlled in part or in full by black women occurred in particular organizational settings. Holy fuck.
cat jumped on my car. <laughs> I'm not sure where it was. Um, historically, living life as an African American woman facilitated this endeavor because knowledge validation processes controlled in part or in full by black women occurred in particular organizational settings. When black women were in charge of their own self-definitions, these four dimensions of black feminist epistemology, lived experience as a creation of meaning, the use of dialogue, the ethic of personal accountability, and the ethic of caring, came to the forefront. When the core themes and interpretive frameworks of black women's knowledge were informed by black feminist epistemology, a rich tradition of black feminist thought ensued. Traditionally, women engaged in this overarching intellectual and political project were blues singers, poets, autobiographers, storytellers, and orators. They became black feminist intellectuals both by doing intellectual work and by being validated as such by everyday black women. Black women in academia could not openly join their ranks without incurring a serious penalty. The community of black women scholars constitutes a second constituency whose epistemological standards must be met. As the number of black women's academics grows, this heterogeneous collectivity shares the similar knowledge location in higher education, yet finds a new challenge in building group solidarities across differences. African American women scholars place varying amounts of importance on furthering black feminist scholarship. However, despite this newfound diversity, since more African American women earn advanced degrees, the range of black feminist scholarship has expanded. Historically, African American women may have brought sensibilities gained from black epistemology to their scholarship, but gaining legitimacy often came with the cost of rejecting such an epistemology. Studying black women's lives at all placed many careers at risk. More recently, increasing numbers of African American women scholars have chosen to study black women's experiences, and to do so by relying on elements of black feminist epistemology in framing their work. A third group whose epistemological standards must be met consists of dominant groups who still control schools, graduate programs, tenure processes, publication outlets, and other mechanisms that legitimate knowledge. African American women academics who aim to advance black feminist thought typically must use dominant Eurocentric epistemologies for this group. The difficulties these black women now face lie less in demonstrating that they could master white male epistemologies than in resisting the hegemonic nature of these patterns of thought in order to see value and use existing alternative black feminist ways of knowledge. For black women who are agents of knowledge within academia, the marginality that accompanies outsider within status can be the source of both frustration and creativity. In an attempt to minimize the differences between the cultural context of African American communities and the expectations of mainstream social institutions, some women dichotomize their behavior and become two different people. Over time, the strain of doing this can be enormous. Others reject black women's accumulated wisdom and work against their own best interests by enforcing the dominant group's specialized thought. Still, others manage to inhabit both contexts, but do so critically, using perspective gains from their outsider within social locations as a source of insights and ideas. But while women can make substantial contributions as agents of knowledge, they rarely do so without substantial personal cost. Eventually, it comes to you, observes Loran Hansberry. The thing that makes you exceptional, if you are at all, is inevitably that which must make you lonely 1969 uh, 148 just as migrating between black and white families raised special issues for black women domestic workers moving among different and competing interpretive communities raises similar epistemological concerns for black feminist thinkers the dilemma facing black women scholars in particular engaging in black feminist thought illustrates difficulties that can accompany grappling with multiple interpretive communities. I read that sentence again. The dilemma facing black women scholars in particular, engaging in creating black feminist thought, illustrates difficulties that can accompany grappling within multiple interpretive communities. A knowledge claim that meets criteria of adequacy for one group and thus is judged to be acceptable may not be translatable into the terms of a different group. Once black women scholars face the notion that on certain dimensions of a black woman's standpoint, 
It may be fruitless to try and translate into other frameworks of truth validated by black feminist epistemology, then other choices emerge. I'll say that again. Once black women scholars face the notion that on certain dimensions of a black woman's standpoint, it may be fruitless to try and translate into other frameworks truths validated by black feminist epistemology, then other choices can emerge. Rather than trying to uncover universal knowledge claims that can withstand the translation from one epistemology to another, initially at least, black women intellectuals might find efforts to rearticulate a black woman's standpoint especially fruitful. Rearticulating a black woman's standpoint refashions the particular and reveals the more universal human dimensions of black women's everyday lives. Toward truth. I'm not sure if I'm reading um, just gotta, oh, okay, yeah, I'm still reading. If I was to read the next heading, it would say, Toward Truth. The existence of black feminist thought suggests another path to the universal truths that may accompany, sorry, that might accompany the truthful identity of what is. In this volume one, place black women's subjectivity in the center of analysis and examine the interdependence of the everyday taken for granted shared by African American women as a group and more specialized knowledge produced by black women intellectuals, and the social conditions shaping both types of thought. This approach allows me to describe the creative tension linking how social conditions influence a black woman's standpoint. This approach allows me to describe the creative tension linking how social conditions influence a black woman's standpoint, and how the power of ideas themselves gave many African American women the strength to shape those social conditions. I approach black feminist thought as situated in a context of domination and not as a system of ideas divorced from political and economic reality. Moreover, I present black feminist thought as subjugated knowledge in that African American women have long struggled to find alternative locations and epistemologies for validating our own self-definitions. In brief, I examined and situated subjugated standpoint of African American women in order to understand black feminist thought as a partial perspective on domination. Because U.S. black women have access to the experiences that accrue to being both black and female, an alternative epistemology used to rearticulate a black woman's standpoint should reflect the convergence of both sets of experiences. Race and gender may be analytically distinct, but in black women's everyday lives they work together. The search for distinguishing features of an alternative epistemology used by African American women reveals that some ideas that Africanist that Africanist scholars identify as characteristically black often bear remarkable resemblance to similar ideas claimed by feminist scholars as characteristically female. This similarity suggests that the actual contours of intersecting oppressions can vary dramatically and yet generate some uniformity in the epistemologies used by subordinate groups. Just as U.S. black women and African American women encountered diverse patterns of intersecting oppressions yet generated similar agendas concerning what mattered in their feminisms, a similar process may be at work regarding the epistemologies of oppressed groups. Thus, the significance of a black feminist epistemology may lie at its ability to enrich our understanding of how subordinate groups create knowledge that fosters both their empowerment and social justice. This approach to black feminist thought allows African American women to explore the epistemological implications of transversal politics. Eventually, this approach may get us to a point at which, claims Elsa Barkley Brown, all people can learn to center in another experience, validate it and judge it by its own standards without need of comparison or need to adopt framework as their own. 1989, page 922. In such politics, one has no need to decenter anyone in order to center someone else. One has only to constantly appropriately pivot the center. Page 922. Rather than emphasizing how black women's standpoint 
and its accompanying epistemology differ from those of white women, black men, and other collectivities, black women's experiences serve as one specific social location for examining points of connection among multiple epistemologies. Viewing black feminist epistemology in this way challenges additive analysis of oppression, claiming that black women have a more accurate view of oppression than do other groups. Such approaches suggest that oppression can be qualified and compared, and that adding layers of oppression produces a potentially clearer standpoint. Spelman, 1988. One implication of some uses of standpoint theory is that the more subordinated the group, the purer the vision available to them. This is an outcome of the origins of standpoint approaches in Marxist social theory, itself reflecting the binary thinking of its Western oranges. <laughs> Western origins. That's really funny. Okay. <clears throat> This is an outcome of the origins of standpoint approaches in Marxist social theory, itself reflecting the binary thinking of its Western origins. Ironically, by quantifying and ranking human oppressions, standpoint theorists invoke criteria for methodological adequacy that resemble those of positivism. Although it is tempting to claim that black women are more oppressed than everyone else, and therefore have the best standpoint from which to understand these mechanisms, processes, and effects of oppression, that is not the case. Instead, those ideas that are validated as true by African American women, African American men, Latina lesbians, Asian American women, Puerto Rican men, and other women with distinctive standpoints, and each group using the epistemological approaches growing from its unique standpoint, become the most objective truths. Each group becomes better able to consider the other group's standpoints without relinquishing the uniqueness of its own standpoint or suppressing the other group's partial perspectives. What is always needed in the appreciation of art or life, maintains Alice Walker, is the larger perspective, connections made, or at least attempted, where none existed before. The straining to encompass in one's glance at the varied world, the common thread, unifying theme throughout immense diversity. 1983, page 5. Partiality and not universality is the condition of being heard. Individuals and groups forwarding knowledge claims without owning their positions are deemed less credible than those who do. Alternative knowledge claims in and of themselves are rarely threatening to conventional knowledge. Such claims are routinely ignored, discredited, or simply absorbed by the marginalized in existing paradigms. Much more threatening is the challenge that alternative epistemologies offer to the basic process used by the powerful to legitimate knowledge claims that in turn justify their right to rule. If the epistemology used to validate knowledge comes into question, then all prior knowledge claims validated under the dominant model become suspect. Alternative epistemologies challenge all certified knowledge and the question of whether what has been taken to be true can stand the test of alternative ways of validating truth. The existence of self-defined black women's standpoint using black feminist epistemology calls into question the content of what currently passes as truth and simultaneously challenges the process of arriving at that truth. Patricia Hill Collins, Black Feminist Epistemology.